Would you stand with me as we read from Luke chapter 17? I'm going to begin in verse 26. Jesus is speaking. He says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planning and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom and fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all, so will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down and take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, in that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the word, as always. As we come to you this morning, we pray that you will, Lord, number one, fill our hearts with a with a renewed vision of who you are. Help us, help us, Father, to see you with, in all of your greatness. Help us to understand and see the greatness of your holiness and of your justice. But also help us to see the greatness of your love and help us to understand you can't separate those two. Those are all parts of who you are. And so as we see both sides this morning, we pray that we will have valid and correct insight into who you are and what you desire and what you will, in fact, impose. We pray that we will then go away different people than we came. We pray that you will give us the compassion for those around us who do not know you. We pray that you'll fill our hearts with confidence and yet at the same time with a sense of urgency. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, please turn to Luke 17 if you're not already there. <clears throat> Real estate agent was showing some property as usual, uh, elaborating on the benefits of this particular piece of property and in fact of this particular community. And so he was going on and on about what a great place this was. The climate was perfect, the neighborhood was perfect, and he really got carried away. He finally said, nobody even dies here. Well, just as he said that, a funeral procession went by in front of the house, right? And people are looking at the house, said, well, if nobody ever dies here, what's that? And he said, oh, well, that's the local mortician. He died of starvation. So... Um, oh, come on, folks. It's, it's not that early. You can keep up better than that. Starved of salvation, or died of starvation. Well, it would be a good case of denial, right? We know that death is the inevitable result of life. And I think that consciously or unconsciously, we have a lot of people who are living in denial about another fact which is the issue of accountability, that we will all, as was mentioned, if you were listening to the passage read from Romans 2 this morning, we will all give an account to the Lord. I think we sometimes think, well, yeah, okay, Hitler may be, Osama probably, but everybody, no. And yet judgment coming is at the core of the teaching of Jesus all the way through the Gospels. It's the reason he came in the first place, to provide the possibility of relief from a coming judgment for people who on their own could never have that relief. 
Now the disciples are still laboring under the impression as we've seen through this passage that Jesus came to set up a kingdom which they expected to take in a universal rulership around the whole world and of which they expected to play a dramatic role. They thought they would be the leaders in this wonderful kingdom. But Jesus has some rather startling clarifications for them in this passage. And all of them relate to a second coming of Christ, something that the disciples at this point in time really had no insight into. Certainly hadn't. They'd heard him talk about it a little bit. He had, he had introduced it in other parables, but it was one of those things that to, just was going right over their head at this point in time. But it's there. And in fact, it's an important piece of the puzzle, obviously. What, you know, what, what, would, what would seem like a discrepancy in the Old Testament? The fact that we have on the one hand this mighty ruling and reigning Messiah, one who will be sitting on the throne of David forever and who will rule in righteousness and judgment forever in various passages of Scripture in the Old Testament, but combined with passages that speak of this same Messiah as a suffering Messiah, a humiliated Messiah. And they didn't know what to do with those, so they threw the Threw the, threw the latter ones out and kept the first ones. But, of course, the answer to the dilemma was that Jesus is going to appear on earth not just once, but twice. He appeared the first time in order to bring about the possibility of salvation, to suffer and to die, to make atonement for sin, to take care, first of all, not of the Rome problem, but of the sin problem, which is at the heart of everything. And so he's going to Jerusalem this time, not for a coronation, but for a cross that will provide the atoning death and resurrection that's required if anybody's going to be saved. But someday, he is coming again. Someday, he will come in a manner far more in keeping with the disciples' expectations. His second coming. And we can anticipate, beloved, that if he came literally and bodily the first time, he's going to come that same way the second time. We have people who spiritualize that away. You really can't do that. The first coming is literal, and in some verses in the Old Testament, it's right next to the other, to the second coming in the very same verse. Then the second coming must be just as literal as the first. He is coming again. And he characterizes that second coming in eight different ways in this passage of Scripture that we've seen as we've begun to look at it. We've been through five of them. We'll finish up this morning, Lord willing. But we've seen, first of all, that Jesus' coming is desired by true believers in verse 22 of this passage. Those who really belong to God or part of the family of God long for his coming. Do you long for his coming? It'd be one sign that you really belong to him. He asks us to pray for it in the Lord's Prayer. What's one of the very first things that we're to pray for? Your kingdom come, right? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's to be part of the, of the heart's desire that true believers have. Secondly, he teaches them that Jesus' coming will be not yet to the disciples in verse 22b, second part of that verse. What they expect is coming, yes, but while they can accept the spiritual rulership of God in their hearts even now, as he goes to the cross and dies and pays the price for their salvation, they will not see the physical aspects of the kingdom yet, not in their lifetime. Basically tells them that here, he tells them the same thing in the book of John. Thirdly, Jesus' coming will be unmistakable, verses 23 and 24. When it does come, you won't have to worry. You will know. The whole world will know. So if anyone says, well, he's already come and, you know, he just, he came spiritually and, you know, you, it's a secret thing. It's only the people who know him that, that, that understand. They've missed what the scripture's saying here. The Lord is saying he's, everybody will see. The whole world will know that Jesus has come when he comes again. There will be no mistaking his coming. A fourth thing, in verse 25, Jesus' coming is delayed by rejection. There was a reason why he did not and could not set up the physical aspect, the culmination of his kingdom during his first coming. And it was the rejection of his own people that caused that. Fifthly, Jesus' coming is unexpected as to its timing. We don't know. I don't know. You don't know. And contrary to what others say, they don't know either. 
No one knows. Jesus himself didn't know. Jesus' last words to his disciples just before he ascended into heaven after they asked him, well, are you going to set up the kingdom now where it's not for you to know the times or the seasons? Just go and be faithful, be my witnesses. Jesus' coming is unexpected in its timing because if we don't know when it's going to come, if we can expect it any time, we need to be ready all the time, right? That's the point. So we don't know. So that leaves three characteristics that we will deal with this morning. All of them relate to judgment. Because in this latter passage of this, latter part of this passage, Jesus is exploding the myth that people are not accountable. It's so easy because the time has been so long from a human perspective between the comings of Christ. Now we've seen in 2 Peter, it's two days in God's time, which really means it's, it's nothing but in human time, it seems like a long time, 2,000 years. Life is normal. We, we are so used to norm, normalcy. And so we anticipate that he will not come, but this is gonna explode that myth. Jesus is telling us information that we need to know here, that the second coming there will be accountability. There will be judgment. As salvation was the key to his first coming, preparing spiritually for the kingdom. Judgment is the key to his second coming, preparing for the physical uh, dimension of the kingdom. Because the kingdom, when it comes now in the second coming, will be perfect. Do you realize that? Everything's going to be perfect overnight. But you can't have perfect if you don't take away the evil. And so judgment will come. So three points. The sixth one in our total of eight outline, Jesus' coming is characterized by judgment, verses 26 through 30. This is where Jesus talks about the time of Noah and the time of Lot. And his point is in this passage, don't be fooled by normality. Don't be fooled by the fact that things seem to be going along as they always have. People are still marrying and giving in marriage. People are still going about their business of buying and selling. But don't be fooled. The day will come when that all changes immediately. So I saw this, this cartoon one time. This guy's on a trapeze, right? And he, and he releases to go to the trapeze where his partner's going to be on the other one that's coming toward him. We've all seen it in the circus, right? Done it thousands of times before. Only this time when he looks up, he sees not his partner on the other trapeze, but it's coming toward him and there's nothing on it except a little note. As he gets closer, the note says, Dear John, I don't know how to tell you this. That would be bad news, right? No easy way to tell you this. What had been normal for so long was no longer normal. And see, that's the way it was in the days of Noah. Hundreds of years of norm normalcy had gone on. In fact, there had been 120 years, according to 2 Peter, that Noah had been preaching as a preacher of righteousness that judgment was coming. And he even talked about a flood, which many commentators believe there hadn't even been rain on the earth prior to that time. So Noah's talking about something that's totally foreign to these people. It's kind of, what? 120 years, everything was normal. 120 years, no rain, no flood, no anything. Flood that never came was what Noah seemed to be preaching. And then suddenly one day it came. And there were a lot of surprised and horrified people. And so imagine what it's going to be like when Jesus comes, this time not to seek and to save but this time to judge. You know, God, God periodically gives, you know, in, in some ways God is subtle. In some ways he's so subtle that, that we miss the message oftentimes. But he gives previews of judgment. Did you, did you realize that? I mean, he does it in the Bible. He, he, occasionally there is instantaneous judgment to emphasize the fact that even though it doesn't happen to everybody instantaneously, judgment is the end result of rejecting him. Do you remember in Leviticus 10 how two sons of Noah, Bihu, of Aaron, Bihu, Bihu and, and Abinadab, they were priests and they had been anointed to this special task to be able to 
carry on the new temple function for the children of Israel. And the very first time they go in, they disobey some way the command that God had given them about bringing strange fire into the, into the tabernacle for the, for the offering, for the sacrificial offering. We don't know exactly what the phrase means when it says strange fire. I think if you read, you'll find at the inauguration, God sent the fire from heaven. And I suspect they were to keep that fire and make it the, 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 the starting point for the next sacrifice. Instead, they just brought their whatever lighters in and lit the fire. And God killed them incidentally. How, how could he do that? And he didn't just do that. Read the passage. He told, he told Aaron, don't you dare mourn for those boys. What's his point? His point is judgment is real. His point is this is what you all deserve. But to withhold judgment for a time so that you have time to repent. He does the same thing with Uzzah. Remember Uzzah? Uzzah's a guy that's helping David bring the Ark of the Covenant back to the city of Jerusalem. And the ark starts to fall. They put it on an ox cart and the ark, ark starts to fall off as they hit a hole or something and Uzzah reaches out to touch it and he's killed instantly. Why? Well, number one, they weren't supposed to have the ark on a cart. They had a way to carry it that God had prescribed by poles that they were to carry on their shoulders. And secondly, nobody was supposed to touch that ark. God killed him instantly. To make what point? That judgment is real. The judgment happens. Jesus made the same point. Remember in Luke 13, we read about it where, the, where, where, where you know, somebody asked him, what about those people that were killed when this tower fell? Why? Why would you do that? And Jesus says, you're asking the wrong question. The question isn't, why did the, why did the tower fall on those 18 people? Why, the question is, why didn't it fall on you? You're all subject to judgment. It is only the patience and the love of God who is not willing that any should perish, that any of us get another day. Love. Judgment is real. Augustine said it this way. He said, when God wants to, he takes notice of human sin and judges it. He doesn't defer for even a moment. On the other hand, when he wants to, he does defer judgment. Why? Why? Because if he never judged in the present time, God would be thought not to exist. But if he judged everything in the present time, nothing would be left for the judgment. He's right. Romans 2.4, in the middle of the passage we read this morning, says this, it says, God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. There's a reason for God forbearing for whatever period of time he does in all of our lives, and that is that we might have time to repent. But, but what we have to remember, beloved, is that judgment deferred does not mean judgment denied. All who reject Christ will give account either at their death or at the time of Jesus' second coming. And at the time of Jesus' second coming, it'll be instantaneous judgment, right? For those who have rejected him. A whole generation we'll find that they are judged instant, instantly, just as happened in the days of Noah and Lot. Only at that time, that judgment will begin the beginning of a cleansing that cleanses the whole earth and sets up this perfectly possible kingdom, a once and for all cleansing. Second coming will be different from the first, won't it? First had the virgin birth. The first had the patience of God. The first had the miracles. And the first had the preaching of Christ. The first had the compassion of God shown in multiple, multiple, multiple ways, time after time after time. The first coming of Christ was so that he could come to seek and to save. But the second coming will be different. Listen to the description. We read it a couple weeks ago in Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11. He says, Then I saw heaven open, John speaking, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it, is called faithful and true. He's not coming as a baby in a manger the next time. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. If that were to happen today, are you ready? I mean, if you were to meet this Christ face to face, are you ready? Have you taken advantage of the time that he's given you? Are you ready to answer I think if any of, you know, we have to realize if, 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 if the answer to that is I, I'm, I'm ready to answer for my life, I'm really to defend myself, then you are dead in your tracks. 
if the answer is I'm ready to answer that I love Jesus Christ and he's my Lord and Savior, you got the right answer. It's the only answer. It's why he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so he will come. But normal will end on the day that he comes again. There'll be no more normal as we know it. That day will come, beloved, just as surely as we sit here this morning. And, the, and when that day comes, the door of opportunity will be over. It will be closed forever. If you want to know why God hasn't come yet, it's because he's giving time for people to come to know him. There's a flight attendant came on and announced, you know, this flight one day. You're, you're now on board flight 1124 to Boston. If Boston is not in your plans today, please let us know so we can redirect you and get you on the right flight, right? You've all heard an announcement similar to that. Well, people kept coming on this flight. Eventually, the doors were closed, and the flight attendant came on again and said, this is flight 1124 to Boston. If Boston is not in your plans today, it is now. It is now. And you see, that's what Jesus is saying here. That's what it'll be like a lot like for a lot of people when Jesus comes. We're all sinners by nature and by our own choice. What's the answer? The answer is to accept the gift of eternal life that Jesus freely offers to all who will believe in him, but for those who won't, for those who will not repent on the basis of the forbearance of God, giving them time. In fact, usually time after time after time after time. Those who will not repent will find that when he comes again, the door will be closed and the announcement will be made. This is flight number one to hell. If hell was not on your flight plans today, it is now. The day comes when the door closes, beloved. So we're going to take action now. Repentance. This is, that's why Paul says now, now is the day of salvation. Now is the day to repent. Jesus' coming is characterized by judgment. Seventhly, Jesus' coming is characterized by division. Division. Now, if you were with us, you'll recall that Jesus has already talked about division, how in this world, his coming, his very presence will separate mother-in-law from, from, uh, from wife, husband from wife, children from parents. In some cases, there will be division even by his coming, but it'll be nothing compared to the second coming. Look at verse 34 and 35. I tell you, in that night, there will be two in one bed. Think about this. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. Jesus' coming will be divisive in the ultimate sense. People who are equals, people who are about the same task, people who are perhaps husband and wife in the case of those who are even in bed together, they will suddenly be separated without notice. One be taken and the other left. I mean, can you even imagine what that will be like? Jesus' coming will divide the world into two parts. Those who have accepted him and those who have not. Please understand, not the good ones and the bad ones, but those who have accepted him and those who have not. We have no righteousness outside of the righteousness of Christ. We don't. So it's not about how good or bad we are. If you are in Christ, you're going to want to be good, and you'll be the best person that you can be. You will. Either that or you can count yourself not part of the body of Christ. Outside of Christ, you will live your selfishly oriented life, even though you may do some things that are really nice from an outward perspective. You're doing them because of things you'll get from it. It's a selfish existence. It's a me as God existence. That's what the division will be about. Not who's good and who's bad, but who has accepted Christ and who hasn't. Who believes in him and who doesn't. Now, there's a big question here. Some want to know, is the one taken, taken in judgment, and the other is left to safety? Or is the one taken, taken to safety, and the other left to judgment? It kind of, it, it's kind of a question, is this the first part of the first coming of Christ, the, the first phase of, of God's second coming, Christ's second coming, 
the beginning of the tribulation, what we called the rapture. We told you about that a few weeks ago. When those who are in Christ, the dead in Christ will be raised. Those who are alive and living in him will be raised and will go to, and to meet him in the sky. And then seven years later is the second coming when he comes to earth and we have what I think is described here. I don't think the rapture is introduced at this point in this passage. I think this is the second coming. I think those taken are taken in judgment. In other words, commentators are all over the place on this. They completely differ. But to me, it seems relatively easy. First of all, in verse 27, Jesus likens his coming to the time of Noah, right? And he makes the same comparison. If you were to look at Matthew 24, in verse 39, it says in, in that passage, they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So he adds a comment there in Matthew's gospel that says that those who were taken at the time of Noah were taken in judgment. So you would assume that when he says taken here, he's talking about the same thing, taken in judgment. Second, if you were to look at Matthew 25, Jesus speaks of the division that will happen at the time of his second coming. And he talks about that in terms of, of two examples. He says there will be the sheep and there will be the goats. There's no cattle in between. There's no middle ground here. There's the sheep and there's the goats. The sheep are those who are saved, part of his fold, John 10. The goats are those who are not. Doesn't mean goats are bad, it just means that Jesus was using that as an example, right? We got some goat lovers out here, don't we, right? <laughs> Jesus is just using those two to make the point. And what he says is this in Matthew 25, verse 41. He says, then he, Jesus, when he comes, will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire to prepared for the devil and his angels. So that it's those who are, have never accepted him, those who are living in their own existence, they're not in Christ, those are the ones who will be taken away. They will be taken in judgment. So I think the same is true here. Thirdly, Immediately after this judgment comes the thousand-year reign of Christ, the kingdom of God coming to earth. Into that kingdom will go people who are living people who will be part of that kingdom. Now, those are not living unsaved people. Those are living saved people. So I think that the ones who are taken here are ones who are taken in judgment. You don't have to be dogmatic about it, but the, the point is, the big point is there's a division there will be no more. In fact, in another place, Jesus says, the disciples are asking, what should we do? And Jesus says, listen, let the wheat and the tares, you know, let them grow up together. Because why? Because I'll do the separating when I come again. By wheat and tares, he means those who are believers and those who are not. Not the good ones and the bad ones again, but those who are believers and those who are not. He says, let them grow together. When I come, I'll divide. And he surely does. Now, another question we should ask is, on what basis is this division? I've already mentioned it's believers versus unbelievers, but look how he makes that point in verse 31. So back up to verse 31, Luke 17. He says, on that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away, and likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. Now, hang with me here for a second. Oftentimes, this passage has been used to teach that in one's hurry to escape judgment, he shouldn't go back and grab anything out of the house, just get out. Language very similar to this is used again in Matthew 24, verses 17 and 18. Don't, you don't need to look, but it's, it's, it's very similar language. When he says, don't, if you're on the housetop, don't go in the house to get your stuff. Get out of, get out of Dodge, basically, is what he's saying. But, here's, but there's a difference here, and you have to understand this, so you'll miss the meaning of this passage. In Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about a time in the middle of the tribulation. He's talking about a time in the middle of that seven years. And Israel has been protected by the 
when he was called the Antichrist earlier on during that first seven and a half, three and a half years of the tribulation. But now he's going to come in and he's going to bring all his guns to bear against Israel all of a sudden in the middle. And Jesus is saying in Matthew 24, when that begins to happen, you better get out of town. Because he's going to be horrible in Jerusalem after that. And he's right. But this is, see, this is at the end of the tribulation. This is when Jesus is already set, is setting foot on earth. There's no escaping this judgment. So why does he use this language about not looking, not, not, not looking back if you're in the field and not going in the house to grab your stuff if you're on top of the house? Why is he, why is he saying that? Well, he gives us a clue. He says in verse 32, remember Lot's wife. So let's do that. Let's remember Lot's wife for a moment. What did Lot's wife do? What about her would be instructive about this passage? Well, it's all in Luke. It's all in Genesis 19. We won't turn there to get the whole story, but you remember the story. Lot and his wife are living in the wicked city of Sodom. Lot, even though he is hardly a righteous man outwardly, is called by Peter a righteous man who vexed his righteous soul in the city of Sodom. He was living in the middle of sin. He was participating in that sin, and still he could be called a righteous man. Don't go too far with that. He's the only guy in the whole Bible that I know of that's actually called a righteous man when he's pretty much living a sinful life. We like to think, well, you can be carnal and saved. Yeah, but if you think you can be carnal and saved, you can also think you're saved and be carnal and you're just unsaved. And it's most likely the latter. But Lot was living there with his wife. And you remember how judgment was going to come. And so God sent two angels to warn Lot. Because why? Because Lot was so good? No, because Abraham prayed for him. Remember that? His uncle Abraham prayed for him. And so God sent the two angels down there to let Lot know this is what's going to happen. You better get out. You can read about all the trouble they had there, but eventually they got out of town. And the angels led Lot and his wife and his two daughters to leave. But you remember Lot's wife, which is what Jesus asked to do. What happened to Lot's wife? You recall that she hadn't gone very far and the fire came and the sulfur came and everything was being destroyed in Sodom and Lot's wife turned around and looked back. She'd been told not to do that. Why? She didn't want to lose her things. She didn't want to lose her position. She didn't want to lose her prestige. Her whole life was burning up and she still longed for it. She longed for what she had had more than she longed for the God who was rescuing her. What Jesus is saying here is to come down off the house and go get your things would be to hang on to what is in this life for you even as you see Jesus coming. You're not anticipating the coming of Christ. You don't love the coming of Christ. When you see Christ coming, you're more interested in preserving the life that you had than you are in loving him. So that's, that's what he's saying. What he's saying is what you, your actions at that point in time are going to reveal what's really real in your heart. We better ask ourselves, what would we do, right? John said in 1 John 3, I can hardly wait to see Christ, right? Remember how he said that? Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doesn't appear yet what we shall be, but we know that when we shall see him, we shall be like him. And he says, I can hardly wait. Is that how you feel? Or are you going to be grabbing onto the big screen and the baseball bat and the career computer? I, I don't know what it is. What is it that's more important? What is it that you love more than you love Christ? That would demonstrate that you don't have true saving faith. The Bible says this in James 4. You adulterous people, He's speaking to people who are ostensibly believers. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy with God. Do you love this world? Do you love the things that are in this world? Does that drive you more than your love of Jesus? Then at the time Jesus comes, if you're still alive here on earth, the chances are you're going to be grabbing for that life that you have rather than the life that awaits you. 
But Jesus says in verse 33, whoever seeks to preserve his life on earth, in other words, will lose it. Whatever loses his life to Christ, he's in Christ. To this world, it looks like he's lost it. And actually, it's in actual fact, what? He will keep it. There's only one way to keep your life eternally, and that's to belong to Jesus Christ. It's the only way. 1 John 2, John says again, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, I don't know what it is about the world that you love. It's not that we're not to enjoy the things. God tells us he gives us all things to enjoy. That's not the issue. The issue is what's in first place. What comes above Christ? What would you rather do than be with him? Because that would be the sign that when Jesus comes, you're going to be reaching for that thing instead of reaching for him. It says, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father. It's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Jesus' question here really is, what do you treasure? What is your treasure? Where is your treasure? What is your heart desire? So we better settle that question ahead of time, right? Because in that day, you'll just automatically reach for whatever your heart's desire is. That's what he's saying. World lovers will be divided from Jesus' lovers very quickly, very definitely, and very permanently. There will be no second chances then. There was interesting, I don't know about you, but that whole history of Pompeii has always fascinated me. People who could see in the distance, you know, the, the smoke from this volcano for years, and it was kind of normal until the day when it exploded. And for most of them, before they could get out of town, you know, the ashes of Vesuvius were upon them. And there were, they, they found, when they were excavating, they found one lady there. Her feet were headed in the right direction toward the end, toward the gates of town, but, her, but she was turned around like this, trying to pick something up, and the something was preserved. You know what it was? A bag of pearls. Now, I don't know whether she would have had time to get away, even if she didn't reach back. I just know that her heart was revealed by what she was reaching for. And that's what Jesus is saying here. What would you be reaching for when he comes? What's more important to you? Because your heart will surely be revealed at that moment. Your heart will guide what you are reaching for. So there's division when Jesus comes. Division between those who will be reaching for him with all their heart and those who will be reaching for the life that is now disappearing forever. Eighth characteristic, Jesus' coming is characterized by finality. Verse 37. Strange verse, isn't it? When I was reading it, did you wonder why it's there? <laughs> so did I when I was reading it. Jesus, the, the disciples came and said to Jesus when he's talking about how this Division is going to happen. There'll be one in the field, one taken. They said, well, well, where, Lord? And, you know, and honestly, you can't really tell. Are they, are they trying to say, well, where is somebody going to be taken away? Or where is this going to all happen? What is this all about? He said to them, though, where the corpse is, they're the vultures, sometimes translated eagles. Bad translation. I don't know what your Bible says. Should be vultures. They're the vultures will gather. What the picture is, the picture is easy. He's talking about vultures, which we know find carrion, right? They look for dead bodies. Doesn't matter whether they're other animals, whether they're human, what they are. They're looking for animals to eat that are dead. So that's the vulture. So the vulture will gather where the corpse is. So what Jesus is saying here, I think, is very simple. He's saying where the unbelievers are, those who are spiritually dead, spiritually dead. There the vulture will gather. The vulture of what? Judgment. You want to know where this is going to occur? It's going to occur anywhere that I find unbelief. Anywhere that there's rejection of Christ, this is going to occur. 
Judgment will fall, but when it does, it will descend with precision and purpose. The vultures don't go after living things. You could walk by the vulture and they will leave you completely alone, but you die the next minute and you are dead meat, right? That's the way it is because they know. So does God. The vulture of judgment will come where the corpse of unbelief exists and it will consume it. It's popular these days to say, well, people will get another chance. It really won't be that final. It really won't be that bad. People will have a chance to accept Christ later, some, maybe even after they die. I think I've mentioned this before, but Rob Bell in his book, Love Wins, claims that God's love will eventually overcome even the most stubborn opposition, even if, even if it takes, you know, a little bit of time in hell or even if it takes a lot of time in hell. God's love will eventually win, bring people to repentance. Clark Pinnock is another theologian who takes the same approach. He appeals to, quote, his fellow evangelicals to make the shift to a more inclusive outlook, claiming that God will find faith in people without the person even realizing that he or she had it. He follows that up with the assertion that people will be given another chance after death. It's not true. You know, it's not true. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that it is appointed to man once to die. And after that comes judgment. And that's exactly what Jesus is indicating right here in this passage. When he comes again, the door just closed. And the vulture of judgment will find the corpse of unbelief wherever it is. Beloved, you have to look very far in the, in the Bible to find this. All you got to do is go back to the eighth chapter, the ninth, eighth chapter, I think it's the eighth chapter of Genesis. Remember when Noah takes, as long as we're talking about Noah, we might as well put him in here, right? Noah takes the animals into the ark and then he takes his wife and he takes his three sons and he takes their wives and they get into the ark. And then do you know what they do? They wait for a week. Why? Because the door is still open. The door of opportunity is still open. And who closes the door? Noah? No. God closes the door. Read it. God closes the door. What is he doing? He's given a picture that where the corpse of unbelief is, there the vulture of judgment will fall. And it will be the same when Jesus comes again. Our fate is sealed. Either when we die or when Jesus comes again. There's no second chances after that. Don't count on that. I would love for that to be the case. It simply isn't true. That's why God is so urgently asking us to remember that now is the day of salvation, not some time later. Now, today. You're not guaranteed another minute, neither am I. Now is the day of salvation. A few weeks ago, Bob Costas, I'm sure he's invaded all of your living rooms this week, right? He did an interview with a guy named Wade, Wade Boggs. This is a few weeks ago. He didn't do it this week. Wade Boggs is a Hall of Fame third baseman for the Red Sox, and he was with the Red Sox when they lost the World Series in 1986. Remember how they were one out away. They were one strike away. And they lost in game six, and they lost the World Series to the Mets. This is stunning, you know, unbelievable, difficult loss. And so Boggs was on that, on that team, and they, and they showed a picture as the game was ending, the seventh game was ending, they showed a picture of Boggs who's sitting in the dugout, and he's crying. And so Costas naturally asks him, well, he says, he says I'm, I'm sure that hurt. He says, does the hurt ever go away? Listen to this, because here's what Boggs answered. I, I took this down word for word. 
with video recorders, you can do it. You know, I, don't, I wouldn't be fast enough at shorthand otherwise. He said, the World Series was four days after I buried my mother. Tragic. And he began to cry right there on the show. He says, that's why I was crying then. I was crying in part because we lost, but more because I knew I had to go home. I knew I had to go home and walk in the door. My mom wasn't going to be there. It crushed me. That's why I was crying. I came back from her funeral knowing that when I crossed the white line, I could play and it would alleviate the hurt. But when the finality of the last out was done, it was over. I didn't have the white line anymore. I knew I was going home and through the door and she wouldn't be there. I never wanted to face that door, but I had to once the last out was made. Do you catch what he's saying? He's saying, I could live with myself and with the situation while everything was normal between the white lines. I was distracted by baseball. So I could forget about my mom's death. I could forget about eternal things. I could concentrate on the here and now and everything was good. But then came the last out. The last out is coming, beloved either on the day we die or on the day that Jesus comes again, either of which could be any time. Are you ready to go through the door? Now here's the, the good news. Why was Jesus here in the first place? Why was Jesus giving this sermon? Why was Jesus making this announcement? Here's why. Because Jesus has already gone through that door for you so that when you go through it, you don't have to go through the door of judgment. You can go through the door that leads to eternal life. He went through the door of judgment, so you don't have to. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for um, these reminders. They're difficult, Lord, but you're just trying to help us face reality. And Lord, while it would be harsh if there weren't a solution, there is a solution. The solution is what you did on the cross. The solution is not what we can do. Never will be what we can do. But it's what you've done. So I'm asking as we have so many times, Father, for any, those who are here this morning who, who don't know you, they've, they've never really given their heart and life to you. If you were to come today, they would be reaching back. They would be saying, but I got a baseball game. I don't want to miss. Oh, but I don't want to, I don't want to miss the Olympics I, I, I have this relationship and I'm going to see them this afternoon. I would rather see them than I would see you. I, Lord, the list goes on and on of the things that would keep us from you. Don't let it be so. Call that heart out. I pray this morning. Lord, I just ask you with, with all the faith I know how, call those who do not know you this morning and allow them to accept you now by repenting of their sin and turning in their full heart over to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.